Thanks so much, everybody. Um, thanks for all your patience. Uh, our next panel is what? Our next panel is what is the future of Afghanistan and of the Afghan diaspora? Uh, it's going to be moderated by Tresha Mavil, who is an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker and is also a board member in the Friends of the American University of Afghanistan. So our panelists should all be ready, and thank you all for your patience. Uh, I am so happy to be here today with um, Leslie. Leslie, Sch I always get your last name wrong, but Sch Schweitzer. 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 Um, Leslie is one of the few Americans who has been to Afghanistan recently. Um, she is the founder and chair of the Friends of the American University of Afghanistan, and uh, she is an amazing women, woman who is going to share some great stories about her time in Afghanistan. And we have um, also Ambassador Roya Romani, who, um, well, she was the first female um, ambassador to the United States. She's very well known here, and um, she's a real superstar as well. And we have Aquila Nuras. She's the project manager at Friends of the American University of Afghanistan. So thank you for doing this today. Leslie, let's start with you. Um, you've made a few trips to Afghanistan since the withdrawal. Tell us what you've seen, what you've heard. Um, are you safe when you go there? Um, yeah, I've been there twice in the last um, 10 months. I'll go back again soon. Um, for all the obvious reasons, I keep it very quiet. Um, I have observed, I feel it's very important to get your own view, see it on, be on the ground and see what's happening. Um, media doesn't always get it right. Um, I have visited women-owned shops in Kabul. I have gone in them and bought scarves and women are in charge. I have walked the streets for short periods of time in Kabul. Um, I have been in parks and seen women in the parks and women on the street um, without a mahram, running fruit strands and vegetable stands. Um, it is safer, and that's because the bad guys are in charge. And um, you feel safer in a car, in a traffic jam, and those of you who have been to Kabul particularly know that in a traffic jam, your fears some kid on a bicycle is gonna stick a magnetic bomb under your car. Um, that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, it's, a, it's a very different kind of atmosphere, um, and it is one in which Afghan women are always in great danger, and, but I'm seeing, we've had 20 years of educating Afghan women and Afghan men, and that's not going away. You're not going to put these women back in the bottle. Um, and I am happy to talk to any of you individually in more detail. I'm just hesitant to do that in a large audience. So you perform you know, in a remarkable feat. You've got your students out. Um, they, they are around the world, still being educated. Um, but some have stayed. Can you tell me what the mood is um, for the women, um, the people who were not, uh, who weren't lucky enough to to flee the country. Um, I, I can tell you. And tell us about the people who were lucky enough to be in. Well, we we did a major evacuation program in August of of uh, 2021. I was headed to Kabul. I got stuck in Doha, which made it easier to manage all of the evacuation of hundreds of our students, our our faculty, and our um, uh, staff. Um, the American University of Afghanistan, to give you a little background, was the dream of Laura Bush. And in 2004, she um, acquired the funding. And the first class was in 2006. It's the American University of Afghanistan. It's the only not-for-profit, private, co-ed, non-sectarian university in the history of Afghanistan. We started with 50 men and one woman. And um, as of August of 2021, we had nearly 2,000 students in our graduate program, undergraduate, and our, our, our 
Preparation Institute, which was to, to give particularly women the additional English language training, math, et cetera, that they needed in order to enter the university. Um, in August of 2021, the American University of Afghanistan had the, the graduates had the highest percentage of Fulbright scholars of any university in the world, 11%. And I believe Harvard has two or three. Um, so it's an extraordinary world-class university. We continue, we have students in 16 countries around the world, um, many of whom we have evacuated. They're in Pakistan, Iran, uh, Europe, they're all over the world. Uh, I think the thing that made this university unique, American style of education, which we take for granted, critical thinking, um, transparency. Um, it's the first time, and, and Akla is one of our students, uh, a graduate, and it's the first time that when they come to take their preliminary courses that the men have ever been in a room with a woman other than a relative. And the same with the women have never been in a room with a man other than a relative. Within a month on campus, they're kicking soccer balls together. Um, this was an oasis in the middle of chaos. 70 acres of land um, that we built absolutely. And it looked like any small college campus anywhere in the world. And again, you can't take that kind of education away. This is, it wasn't just the gender issues, it was provincial, it was ethnic. And the first time that these students had ever been able to, um, or ever been exposed to a different ethnic background or provincial um, background. So it, I wish we had another decade. Um, it is now very challenging, but we continue to have students all over the world, we continue courses and the really good news is that the government of Qatar has provided a hub at Education City. So we're with Georgetown, uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Northwestern. Our, we have a campus there where our faculty and staff are primarily housed with their families and 200 students. Ambassador Romani, you went from being the most important Afghan woman in America and also in Afghanistan now having a government or a pretend government, whatever we are going to call them, that you know would refuse you the ability to speak or to walk out without your husband or nephew or whatever. I want to know how you feel about that, but also when I say when I hear Taliban 2.0, I immediately become very upset. But I said it to you, and you had a very different viewpoint. And I'd like you to share that viewpoint, because I think it's a very enlightened point of view. Well, thank you so much uh, for organizing this panel. And a warm good afternoon to everybody uh, present here. Um, how do I feel about uh, my ability to speak on behalf of my country and it's incumbent government to becoming the person that basically back in my country is supposed to be voiceless. Uh, I think, honestly, it, uh, the first and foremost is a sense of failure. I, and I think it's a collective failure for all Afghans uh, particularly the ones that had the opportunity to have an education have ability to contribute, work. Uh, it's a feeling of regret. It's a feeling of distrust. And it can unfold like an onion in terms of the uh, emotions one would feel edging into everything in terms of the foreign uh, relations, in terms of how everything came together and fall apart, uh, and much more. But uh, as, you, as we were uh, sh briefly discussing in terms of, is there a Taliban 2.0? Or is that, is that term uh, real or not? If, 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 you, if you attach it to the timeline and, and the reversal of the, the regime and their comeback, sure, you can call that. But is that, is that 
in reality a different Taliban that they were uh, in 1990s. Uh, I would say it depends what, what aspect of them you are analyzing and looking at. We, I do not think much is different when it comes to the core ideological mentality where from which the Taliban leadership is um, feeding off or is uh, fueled by and the leadership that sits in Kandahar and the one that they want to still have it in charge in order to hold together. There is, in terms of their ideological base, there is not much of a difference. However, with the different groups coming together under this name, we briefly discussed that you can never term all the members of one party to be the same. You can never term all members of a group or an ethnicity to be the same. In this group also, there is different faction and fractions that have different points of view. I will share something. There was a um, very, very high level delegation uh, that went to Afghanistan very recently and met with a dozen of the Taliban's ministers. And this delegation asked them why you are not allowing education for women. And each minister said, I don't know why we are doing what we are doing. And we do not agree. So they had different, very different views. So that is, so in terms of ideology, no. In terms of practice, yes. Because of what Leslie just said, who has been recently in Kabul. In 90s, in 1990s, mid 1990s, it was a ghost city. It was like Kabul was a ghost city. It was very different. It's not the same anymore. What has happened? Yes, they sent all women to prison, metaphorically. They don't allow them to study and work and all the, that. But they do get to go to places and to to do things. And and people has that sense of. Um, safety that they didn't have before, and it is again because the, the perpetrators of violence are now in charge. So with, with that, uh, it is not the Taliban, I would say, that has changed, except that they have become way smarter, studying very thoroughly international community and their moves. They know very well how to negotiate and get by that they, they have. They have learned very well from the past mistakes of the previous governments. They know not to, what to do and what not to do. And the changes that we see, the, the fact that they are, people have a life different than they did in 90, uh, 1990s under the Taliban rule is due to the, the very understanding that they cannot act exactly the same way that they did back then. To kick everybody to the mosque and have a razor to shave them on the streets, that's not happening. It is not happening because they know that this past 20 years educated the people. The educated cannot be uneducated. The liberated mind cannot be confined again. So they very well understand that. And they, they, however, although they are, they are acting differently in terms of the enforcement of whatever they put out, people do not necessarily think of them as their government. There is still this huge disjoint as us and them, people of Afghanistan and the Taliban. Let me just add to that. Also, you have some Taliban ministers, and I've met with, I don't know, many, many, many of them who've been educated internationally and who have sent their daughters to be educated mm -hmm. internationally. I've actually had one minister hand me his daughter's names and will you enroll them in your university. Um, so there is, it, it's, it's a bit of a different breed, uh, and not all of them. And I, I think- like there's a, a split, a rift in the well, Taliban I, that they- I think I, Roy is absolutely right. I mean, there's, all Democrats aren't all the same. All Republicans aren't the same. We all know that. And that's always been true of the Taliban, but I think even more so now. But can they hold and keep power if there's a rift? Are they strong enough to do that? I don't have a crystal ball. I, uh, I know what I hope, but. For me, what has always stirred 
the political stability of the country, one way or another, and has supported coups and rebellions and whatnot, has been always externally motivated. So whenever people say, is there a chance for a change, a resistance? Like people, yes, people do resist, but, but when, when they, you have such an authoritarian regime, it's very hard to resist. Like, what to give for what you gain, that calculation doesn't make sense for people, and this is why they have to put up with it. Unless there is an external motivation and support, I have not seen and have not studied anything happening in the recent, recent history of the country. In fact, in most, almost all of the history of the country, everything that has ever happened has been externally motivated. Now, Akola has a very good story to tell. <laughs> she was born in 2000. And uh, she's a graduate, one of the Leslie Store students. But uh, tell us about your journey and um, about living under, uh, you know, living alongside Americans who were in your country for 20 years. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yes, I was born in exactly 2000. I've never seen war before 2000. My parents told me about it. I've never seen it. Uh, but um, I was born in Daikundi, a central province of Afghanistan, um, very mountainous, very rural. Uh, I think the first few years, um, one day I ditched my mom and I went to school with my brother because I've never seen a girl going to school. and. There was this question of what's happening there and why my brother can go to school, I cannot. Um, and I think that was the starting point for my parents to understand that, okay, we got to move, we got to um, get our kids into the school, and we moved to Kabul, uh, a totally different city, because before I was in Daikundi, I thought the whole world is um, our village. There's nothing happening outside that mount, uh, uh, um, over those mountains. Uh, but when I got in Kabul, I went to school, um, very interesting um, um, lifestyle, very different than when I was in Daikundi. Um, and um, when I was walking to schools every day, I was a, as a kid, I, w I used to see all these military people with their tanks uh, um, moving on the streets. And I think there's this part of me that uh, uh, I always wanted to wave. I always say, waved and said hi. Um, and my, my, my friend beside me would always tell me, don't do that, you don't know these guys, uh, they might harm you. But I was, I was telling her that, look, there, um, I don't see any harm from these people, and they're the people I see every day, and, and, and they're part of the community, they're my friends, and um, some of these military people would used to wave back at me. Uh, uh, but high school was great. I lived in Kabul um, with the limited opportunities. I came from a minority background. I am Hazara, and there has been constant, um, continuous targeted attacks on my people in the hospitals and, and, and the universities and schools, and, and um, it kept going on. And I was questioning myself of why I am so different than my friends outside what's happening in this country until I was enrolled at the American University of Afghanistan. And um, I totally find a different environment. Uh, my professor at the first day of class asked me, How, what do you think about the syllabus? And I was like, are you kidding me? Are you asking me? Because I've learned that what the professor usually comes into the class, they do a lecture, they go on, what you do is, you memorize that, you put it on the paper in the final exam. But he, on the first day, asked me, what do you think? And I was like, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, so I've learned to, uh, by a period of time, to question and to critique the, the, what the professor said, what my fellow colleagues, my, my fellow students said, because it's very really interesting. You, you, sit, you, you come, you sit with a, a, a boy, an Afghan man, and, and you start the discussion because it's still after, I would say, 15, 16 years of uh, 
um, U.S. presents and, and, and all these people were educating and all these people were educated, you would still, they would still challenge you. You would still need to challenge your mindset. I would, just, I would need to sit with my, uh, my field classmate, a guy, and I would, I would start telling him that, look, bro, you have to think this way. <laughs> this is not right. And, and I, I think I love this conversation. And when I entered the university, um, I think uh, it taught me to make tough decisions. It taught me to dream big and, and chase over these dreams. And uh, it, only, it, it doesn't only taught me to dream big, but it kind of equipped me with to, to use the tools to, to, to take actions. <laughs> What's your next step? What are you going to do next? You graduated. Well, after things were going well, after August um, 2021 happened, I lived with a passport and uh, um, a dust of soil from Afghanistan. I've, I've got nothing to lose. And when I was leaving, my mom told me that, hey, look, you're leaving, and I think you're leaving, you can make it out. Just remember one thing, that you have a mission. Uh, as your mom, I couldn't study in the 2000s. I had to give up, but you cannot. I see my dream in your future. And a lot of moms uh, are visioning their futures and, and their daughters. We just cannot give up on this generation. And you got to go. you got to continue your education. And that's the only thing that they cannot take it away from you any, any, any time. So here I am. And I'm, I'm fulfilling that mission. And um, I will try every day to get better and better. And hopefully one day at the right time, I'll go back and serve in the country again. And she's not leaving me. That's <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah. It's a great story. You know, Tresha, there's, we have 2,000 graduates. Akala is an outstanding one, but there's another almost 2,000 that have the same kind of mentality. And every single one of them, when you ask them if they're here, are they going to go back? And they'll say, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and fight and lead the country. So she's extraordinary, but not terribly unusual with the graduates that we have. It's going to be a great country one day, <laughs> run by women. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Royal will be right at the head of it. Of course. Does anybody have any questions? While they're doing that, I just want to say thank you to New America and to ASU. Um, the world's forgotten about Afghanistan. Yes. And I am deeply appreciative of an opportunity to reinstill in people this need to support Afghanistan. And it is, um, we owe it to them. And I, I tell military uh, guys, women who have been deployed there, all is not lost. There, a lot has been accomplished. But we need your help. You're right, Leslie. The world has forgotten, but we haven't. Thank I mean, you for that. People at New America, ASU, veterans, the military, it's still very fresh. It's still very raw. And, and, and we have an amazing. We're not going to forget anytime yeah. soon. We have an amazing partnership with ASU in that we are, the American University of Afghanistan and ASU have uh, collaborated in an alliance. We have about 60 entities that are part of this. All of this is to continue to fight for the education of women in Afghanistan. So I'm deeply appreciative to ASU. Sir? OK, sorry. My name is Dave Onspot, no affiliation. Do you know uh, of the migrants that try to come across our border into the border into Europe? Does those, does, do those migrants include Afghans? And if they are, do they, and if, if that does, do you know if the the Afghans are able to get asylum in the West that way, or are they turned back and repatriated back to Afghanistan? Thanks. Is the question they're coming over the, the No, I'm saying, do you know if, if they are coming? If they're coming across the border, and if and if they do, are they are are they able to get asylum, or do you know if they being repatriated back to Afghanistan? Both in both. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there is a small number of Afghans who have uh, come across the border from this, uh, through the southern border. Uh, the numbers are small. 
the, whether they get asylum or not, it's much more complicated because the screening at the border, given the migration issues that I don't need to tell you, is uh, very different and, and, and they are being processed differently. In Europe, it totally depends which country you are talking about. The laws, the, the, the policies are different from one place to another. Uh, they are, uh, the number of Afghans trying to get to Europe and who have already tried has been massive. There has been uh, huge fatalities going to, uh, by ship, boats, uh, in, in really uh, terrible situation, get, freezing in the borders that has happened and unfortunately it still continues to happen because a lot of people are still in need of safety who are still living in Afghanistan or the neighboring countries and they are in need of better opportunities to survive. Thanks, Roy Gutman from the <coughs> Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Your, uh, your enthusiasm here and your presence is really a contagious thing. You, it's exciting to hear what you have to say. <coughs> but could you just explain some of the mechanics? How, uh, w after August 21, how did uh, young Afghan women g continue to get university education? I mean, did they go to Qatar? Uh, w did, could they stay in, in Kabul? Uh, how did you do it, Aquila? Um, if you want to hear my life journey, when I got out, I got out through the evacuation effort of the American University of Afghanistan. I went to Doha, but um, I, as I told you, I had a mission that at, under any cost, I'm not going to give up on the education part of my life. And I didn't give up. I continued, continued my classes online when, when I was in Doha. I spent... Uh, two months in Doha and I spent another month, um, I, I, I got evacuated to U.S. after uh, I spent another month in a U.S. military base. Uh, but uh, when I reached out to colleges around uh, the U.S., I was able to transfer my credits to Bard College and um, that's when I went and I graduated last spring. Yeah. We have about 100 students at Bard College, of our, of our students that we evacuated and, and Bard is setting up a dual degree program. So they will graduate next year with a BARD and an American University of Afghanistan degree. And the graduates, the 2,000 graduates. We have uh, many are still in country. Many are attending the best graduate schools in the US and in the UK and Europe. Uh, we still have hundreds in country. We're working very hard to get them employed, um, most of them remotely. Um, I've had Afghan companies headquartered in Dubai say that they will hire our, our students, and we're working very hard to make that, our, our, our alums. They're fluent in English. They've received a world-class education. Um, so it's, it's not easy, but it is something that we're really dedicated to helping them seek employment. But I would like to also add that besides the people that the American University has helped and other uh, organizations and institutions have been actively helping and continue to help, there are still hundreds of thousands yeah. of women who are in need of education. They are simply in prison. Women beyond sixth grade cannot go to school, women cannot work or seek employment, women are restricted from many basic life freedoms and movements, and that's a reality. So except the work of what is happening there, the majority of women with all the aspiration and talent are barred today from seeking education, employment, and just life as a human being. I think, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, but um, thank you all for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.